This lecture is one of my favorite lectures ever. Honestly, I think it's my favorite lecture because it scares me. And I'm always afraid that someone is going to mistakenly identify me as a perpetrator of a crime. I don't know why, but I just have this fear. Hopefully, after this lecture, I can transfer that fear directly to you. Because mistaken eyewitness testimony is scary common. Let's talk about some of those factors. Now look at this. Here's a, a lineup. I mean, this is an old picture. Um, there's something different about one of these gentlemen. If that was a lineup that was presented and the suspect was a black male, Guess who's probably going to get picked up there? Uh, for some reason, I don't think it's this guy here. Okay, take a good look at this gentleman. It's the same guy on both the left and the right. I decided to be extra helpful, give you two pictures. One with uh, nice long hair, and one with a nice uh, clean cut haircut. I'm not sure that clean cut actually describes this guy. Remember him because you're gonna have to pick him out of a lineup later on. All right, you got it? Now, eyewitness testimony is incredibly important. Eyewitness accounts provide crucial evidence that lead to the identification and arrest of suspects in many criminal cases. And it is also critically important in the trial process. So I can't think of more damning evidence than a witness saying, it was him, I saw him do it, that guy right there. And I'd go, what, me? So think about that. If you were a juror and you saw somebody say, yeah, it was him, I saw him, he was there, he did it. That's pretty damning evidence. And juries are heavily influenced by eyewitness identification. You might think that eyewitness identification is one of the best tools to um, convict somebody. And you would be right. But how accurate do you think eyewitness testimony actually is? And laboratory studies, real world studies, lots of studies show that eyewitnesses are most often correct in their identification. But mistaken identification does occur. And when this happens, it can have tragic, tragic consequences. And as a result of human information processing limitations, a person may be mistakenly identified as a criminal suspect by an eyewitness. But that would be like a cognitive problem. I'm wondering if there's any procedural problems that might prevent mistaken eyewitness testimony or foster eyewitness testimony that's false. So when we look at human cognitive processing, we really have three cognitive stages. One is encoding, two is storage, and three is retrieval. So if we look at encoding problems, one thing that has been shown by researchers is that people tend to overestimate the duration of brief events. You've probably had that phenomenon happen. Something stressful happens, it's like three minutes long, but it seems like you were there for an hour. Prolonged events, they tend to underestimate the duration of that time. So that's kind of interesting. Other psychological research has demonstrated that the presence of a weapon reduces the accuracy of eyewitness accounts. So that's called the weapons effect. And this is probably because the observer's attention is directed towards a weapon, thereby diverting attention away from the situational aspects and the perpetrator. You know, perpetrators probably do that important. Like if I pulled out a weapon, I mean, this is just my clicker, but you might look at this instead of looking at my face. 
if this was a gun or a knife. So the amount of time, this is for storage problems, so that's encoding. Lots of different things can affect encoding. And I, I mean, how about just stress? The amount of time that is lapsed between the witnessing of a crime and the subsequent questioning of the individual, there's something that's called memory decay. And this can determine the amount of information that the witnesses recall. Like if you think about one of your psychology classes from last semester, you might not remember as much information. However, there's a process called interference. And this refers to the loss of old stimulus information due to the interference caused by new stimulus information. And that can reduce the accuracy of eyewitness accounts. Now, I don't know what you're like, but I know that my memory of certain events kind of changes over time. Like if I get in a, like a small argument with my wife or something like that, and I remember the story over and over and over and over again, the details kind of change. Um, it just happens. And usually the details change to present me in a more favorable light. Uh, I mean, maybe something's wrong with me, that's fine. But when we remember a story over and over and over and over again, typically the details change. Now, with retrieval of information, one study by Elizabeth Loftus, who's a very famous psychologist and will actually be coming to lecture at school here during the academic year, one of her studies, and this is a great study, I'll show you this on the next slide, found that language alone can influence the retrieval of stimulus information and that suggestive questioning procedures should be eliminated as much as possible to minimize their effect on um, eyewitness accuracy. And unconscious transference, this is, a, we'll see a slide on this in just a second too, refers to the generation of memory that is related to an incident, but is not relevant to the issue being considered. So these two things, uh, suggestive questioning procedures and unconscious transference, I think are very important. So they'll probably find their way onto the final. Here's suggestive questioning. So Elizabeth Loftus and Palmer did this study in 1974, where they showed subjects a film of a car crash Every subject in the study saw the exact same film. And then they were asked a series of follow-up questions. Now, I think the book um, reports like something about broken glass, but the part I think is interesting is the speed. So one group, when they were asked their follow-up questions, they were asked, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? The other group was asked, how fast were the cars going when they contacted each other? So that's just a difference in language, very subtle difference in language too. Well, the smash group reported an average speed of 40.8 miles an hour. However, the contacted group reported 31.8 miles per hour. The only difference in the conditions, like the independent variable, the variable that was manipulated, was the language. Unconscious transference is kind of creepy. So this researcher, Robert Buckow, he staged a mock assault in front of a class of uh, 141 unsuspecting college students. It'd be kind of hard to do this in an online class, but maybe in a real life class. Seven weeks later, the students were asked to pick the perpetrator from a group of six photographs. Of the 60% who did, now no, 40% got it right. 60% got it wrong. Of that 60%, Two-thirds incorrectly chose 
an innocent bystander who was at the crime scene. So that's like the exact same percentage as people who accurately identified the perpetrator. So some people just pick somebody random. The other individuals just pick somebody that was an innocent bystander. How scary is that? I guess, you know, I don't know about you, but my mom would always say, make sure you're not in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or watch out who you hang out with because you might be guilty by association. Here's guilty by association.